BBC World News now. In an exclusive interview, Karishma Vaswani speaks to New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern about the reopening of borders, the country's business ambitions and the impact of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. The country's youngest Prime Minister in over 150 years. The fresh face of politics in New Zealand. Dubbed Jacinda Mania, Miss Ardern's popularity helped propel the Labour Party to a landslide victory in 2017. Three years later, she did it again, getting a second term in office. But it's not been easy. A terrorist attack, a natural disaster, and then the pandemic, all testing the limits of that popularity. An early victory against COVID was short-lived, overwhelmed by the Delta variant, which brought a three-month lockdown. The next wave, Omicron, led to urgent vaccination drives and stricter COVID measures. Many protested for weeks outside Parliament against those mandates. Staying closed off against the world wasn't working. The economy suffered and New Zealanders' patience with their popular Prime Minister also waned. As the US and Europe made way for international travel, the New Zealand government announced in March it will reopen its borders earlier than planned, hoping the influx of tourists will help boost the economy. Now that it's out of that self-imposed pandemic isolation, one of the immediate challenges for the Prime Minister is tackling the rising cost of living. Welcome to BBC News and this special edition of the interview with New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Thank you for joining us, Prime Minister. Kia ora. I'd like to start by saying, you know, this is your first international trip post-COVID. At one point, New Zealand was certainly seen as the success story of the world when it came to COVID. But then after that, you had lockdowns that went on possibly far longer than most people would have wanted. Now you're finally opening up. Do you think that you're, you opened up too slowly? No, I would argue that when you look at the markers of a successful COVID response, none were without cost. You know, we cast our eyes around the world. We've seen every economy uh, take a hit. Health systems come under pressure and devastatingly the loss of lives. So no country has been free of that. Uh, but in New Zealand, we deliberately took the approach that we would pr prioritise the health and well-being of our people uh, and that the best possible health response, in our view, would also create the best possible economic response. And that's been borne out. New Zealand, amongst other OECD nations, have had some of the lowest death rates in, uh, amongst those developed economies. We have uh, seen as well uh, growth uh, in our economy and some of the lowest unemployment we've had at 3.2%. Uh, and importantly, uh, we've looked after New Zealanders. The reopening, very important to us now. We've gradually been moving through and from the 1st of May, we welcome uh, visa waiver countries back into New Zealand. Your critics did say at one point that your policies were bumbling. I think another phrase that was used was that your government had been asleep at the wheel. People were angry. There were protests at Parliament. Do you feel that vaccines should have come in sooner into all of this? We have one of the most highly vaccinated populations uh, in the world, you know, over 90% uh, of our eligible New Zealanders. Uh, and that has served us well. As I say, that's led to the fact that we've had some of the lowest death rates in the OECD. And I think ultimately, as I said, for no country did even vaccine programs uh, come without uh, some debate and discussion. But I do believe that history will tell the story of the world's response to COVID-19. And when it tells New Zealand's story, I'll be proud of the fact that it demonstrated that for us, people came first. And now that we're reopening our borders, we will show that same care to those who come and visit us, knowing that they'll be coming to a safe environment. But your popularity has fallen as a result. I think uh, in recent data that I've seen suggests it, at, it, it is at its lowest since 2017. How concerned are you about that and the fact that people are expressing this unhappiness in New Zealand? There is huge COVID fatigue around the world and you can see that being borne out in many different ways. And so New Zealand is no different, but if the price that we pay for the most successful pandemic response that we could possibly generate under the circumstances is that politically, uh, that there is a change in polls, that is a price we pay. 
Um, but we have to ultimately make sure that we've made the right decisions along the way and that we can sleep at night. You talk about the fatigue that people have had with COVID restrictions, and I'm sure you can understand why people are fed up of that, but it's not just COVID. Mm. It's also the cost of living too, isn't it, uh, Prime Minister? In a recent poll uh, that I've seen in New Zealand, I believe that at almost half of those surveyed thought that the economy there would get worse because of the cost of living crisis. And yet in recent interviews in New Zealand, you've refused to use the word crisis to describe what's going on with the cost of living? Quite the contrary. Um, what we've acknowledged in New Zealand is that yes, indeed, as we've seen around the world, there are a number of countries who through this COVID uh, recovery uh, have felt the impacts of increasing demand during that recovery, additional, the pressure that has created and the supply chain constraints. Uh, and of course, add to that then the war in Ukraine, creating an energy crisis in many countries as well. We know that in New Zealand, we have not been immune to that. New Zealanders are feeling the brunt of that. It has had a huge impact on the cost of living. And you see that in our policy response. Uh, we've immediately tried to cushion the worst of those effects through fuel prices by removing some of the uh, tax for a period of time that New Zealanders feel at the, at the pump. We've brought in a, a, a range of supports for those New Zealanders on the lowest incomes that came in on the 1st of April to ease those pressures. But it actually sits on, on top of a range of measures that we've been taking since 2017. From the moment that we took office, we committed ourselves to bringing in programs like lunches in schools, increasing tax credits for low income families, raising the minimum wage. All of those things have turned on their head the poverty indicators that we have and we're starting to make progress. So the cost of living has actually been an issue for us as a government from the moment we took office. How much worse in your view do you think the cost of living crisis will get in New Zealand? So we've seen uh, uh, economic forecasts that have suggested that we'll have at least another quarter um, at least uh, of potential increases uh, in inflation in New Zealand and New Zealand is not alone in that. But at the same time, they are predicting to see that stabilise. In the meantime, our job is to try and continue to support New Zealanders as we come through this period that, as I say, other countries, um, the UK, the USA and others are also experiencing. We are not alone. I want to talk about China now mm -hmm. and the deal that it struck with the Solomon Islands. I know you've said that you're gravely concerned about the potential militarisation of the region. What options do you have at this point? Well, of course, uh, in our region, we take a collaborative approach as a region. In fact, one of the reasons we've expressed this disappointment uh, at the fact that we have seen uh, now this agreement emerge uh, uh, and supported by both the Solomons and China has been because uh, through the Bikitawa Declaration, it's a declaration that is Pacific Island Forum members we signed up to, explicitly sets an expectation that we look to provide for our own security needs together as a region. And you can see that we have, we have done that. Mm. And the Solomons explicitly, uh, Australia and New Zealand, both have uh, uh, heeded the call of the Solomons for support during recent disruption. Uh, and we've again highlighted that should any extended need exist, we are there to help and support. So that does then lead the question, what gap remains that requires mm. such an agreement with, with China? So our response is again, just to call back uh, to the Solomons to, to come with Pacific Island Forum members and seek an approach as a region. Since we're small uh, island nations, uh, we lean on one another in good times and in bad. You see that in COVID-19 with the sharing of vaccination, support, medical supplies. We simply ask that for security arrangements, we take that same collaborative and collective approach. Would you consider forging closer links, military links with the US the way Australia has done, joining AUKUS, for instance, uh, in an attempt to sort of ward off the influence in the region from China? We've been clear that for some time now, we have seen a growing assertiveness in our region, a growing interest from in the China. region. Uh, explicitly, we have seen from China, but we've also seen greater collaboration from uh, you know, be it from an economic or a humanitarian perspective from other nations as well. And we have to look for, to the good that can be gained from uh, greater collaboration in our region. There is need. Uh, we can we work together on uh, those areas of natural mutual interest. Has this been a sort of wake up call for you when it comes to 
Beijing and its role in the area, you know, where New Zealand is geographically. I know in, in the past, uh, your government hasn't been as vocal as Australia has when it comes to relations with Beijing. I would contest that. And no, I don't consider it a wake up call at all. For some time, we have been pointing to the fact that we are in a highly contested region. The world is changing around us and our region is, is a manifestation of that. And for some time, we've also been calling on you know, the United States, the EU and others to ensure that they look to our region as an area where, as I say, we build those economic relationships as much as we build those other relationships. On our specific relationship with China, we have a fiercely independent foreign policy and I'm proud of the position New Zealand takes. Yes, China is a very important trading partner for us, but it's also a mature relationship for us. We have always been consistent. Uh, where there are areas that we can work together, we will. Uh, but there will always be areas in which we will not necessarily agree. And where those areas arise, we are very forthright and clear on our position. And that includes human rights issues. I want to talk about the war in Ukraine now. New Zealand has sent military and financial aid, and there's more sanctions now on Russia, I believe. Um, in your view, is there a diplomatic way out of this conflict? Well, the only alternative to that is the continued destruction of Ukraine and loss of civilian lives. And so, rightly so, I think the international community continues to invest energy and efforts into economic sanctions uh, that continue to force and put pressure on dialogue. You know, some may question why is it that New Zealand at the bottom of the world has taken such an interest and invested so heavily in ensuring that we are responding alongside others to the invasion of Ukraine. And the answer for us is simple. When you're a small nation as we are, you rely on the international world order. Mm. You rely on that being upheld. You rely on uh, multilateral uh, institutions uh, enforcing and reinforcing uh, the, that international order. And so when you see that threatened, undermined and destroyed by the actions of another, uh, that threatens everyone, including New Zealand. Are we facing, I suppose, a world where it is being split into two sides, as you've described, one that follows the multilateral international order and another that um, could be defined as autocracies. And it's a choice between democracies and autocracies that countries now need to make. I think we uh, should instead, at this juncture in history, uh, instead view that we currently see uh, the, the world speaking uh, forcefully against what we are seeing from Russia against the international uh, uh, rules-based order. Uh, and let's not be quick to create a binary situation uh, between uh, uh, two uh, uh, differing uh, schisms in the world and instead actually focus in on the perpetrator of this violence, the perpetrator of the removal of another nation's territorial integrity, and that is at the hands of Russia. Uh, I think uh, we would exercise caution in being too quick to then, alongside that, turn this into a, a war of ideology. It is Russia who has perpetrated this. It is Russia who must be spoken firmly against. And let's do everything we can diplomatically to ensure that that doesn't grow beyond Russia. It's often discussed your leadership style, which is seen as quite different from what's on offer today, shall we say. Um, how effective have you found it as a way to govern? And if you can sort of reflect on any of the drawbacks that you think it also has. I'm just being myself. And so I don't sit down and necessarily analyze the intricacies of that. All I know is that I want to, the best of my ability, model the traits that I consider important enough to teach my own daughter. Uh, and when you think about the things that we teach our children, the traits uh, like kindness, uh, gratitude, uh, when uh, it's a toddler, sharing. <laughs> and yet somehow when we reflect on the expectations of our political leaders, the character traits we expect are almost the opposite of those mm -hmm. we treat our children. We have an expect expectation around uh, seeing a, a level of confidence that you'd almost describe as arrogant, forthright, um, uh, almost a sense of being uh, assertive and directive. I would like to think that we can see a new range of leadership traits being modelled where kindness isn't seen as weakness, where 
uh, empathy is actually how we understand our decisions impact on our people. And when we start to model those, I hope then that within the public, they see a little bit more of themselves and that perhaps we attract then more people to leadership roles who believe that they can be themselves in roles of leadership. And maybe we'll see more women too. <laughs> a lot of our viewers are interested, I believe. You know, you had to postpone your wedding. Yes. Because of COVID. Yes. Any plans to reschedule oh. now that you're sort of coming out onto the international stage, you're traveling again? Yes, yes. Well, uh, traveling again doesn't mean there's uh, a lot of time for wedding planning or indeed the right weather for um, uh, an outdoor we uh, wedding. So, so no, no set date, uh, just intention. And that's, I think when you uh, live together, have a child together, actually just intention is enough. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for joining us today on the interview and this special edition on BBC News. Thank you. Thank you.